From Honolulu to Hiroshima, from Berlin to Burma, not a corner of the globe escaped the effects of the most devastating and obliterating war in the history of the world, the Second World War. Shortly after America's entry into the war, the government hurriedly constructed air bases and training facilities, like this one outside of Harrington, Kansas. Rolling acres of serene pasture land dotted with cattle were transformed overnight into miles of concrete runways, humming with the roar of new bomber engines. Nearly 50 years ago, this was a beehive of war activity. Today, only a few leaning buildings and crumbling foundations remain. Join me as I take one last look at the forgotten Harrington Air Base. When Kansans think of their state's participation in the Second World War, air bases such as Smoky Hill in Salina or Forbes Field in Topeka typically come to mind. Certainly these air bases and the communities that hosted them performed a tremendous task. But air bases in smaller communities around our state have not shared this notoriety. Harrington's air base is truly one of those unsung heroes. Housing over 4,000 troops, with its own infirmary, fire department, chapel, the state's largest swimming pool, a movie theater, a golf course, a bowling alley, and its own weekly newspaper, the Harrington Air Base was a self-sufficient 2,000-acre city. But the heart and purpose of the Air Base was its five miles of long concrete runways. On September 2, 1942, construction began on the Harrington Army Airfield. Chosen for its flat terrain, central location, relatively high altitude, and its lack of treacherous fog, the field was to originally serve as an interceptor command base for B-17s and B-24s. Bombers fresh from the Wichita Boeing assembling plant were flown to Harrington, where they met the crews that were to take them to a war halfway around the globe. Crews spent weeks at the base, familiarizing themselves with their machines. Often, a newly formed bomber crew became like family, and their assigned warbirds became like home. Lady Be Good, Sad Sack, Wee Willie, and the Feather Merchant are just some of the famous B-24s that were processed in Harrington. In June of 1944, the Harrington Air Base was transformed into one of the most powerful arsenals of democracy in the Second World War. The runways were expanded for the most advanced and devastating war machine of the day, the B-29. The B-29 was the largest combat aircraft to date, an aircraft that was to strike the heart of Japan without the need of an American invasion. This mammoth machine was to be the very instrument that brought the war to an end. But the B-29 was hastily constructed and plagued with serious engineering faults. Fifty-five major modifications in areas such as the electrical system, the fire control system, the tires, the propeller feathering system, and the engine were in dire need of being ironed out. The chips were down, and it was up to the already overworked personnel in the Kansas airfields to decide the fate of this new B-29. The famous Battle of Kansas had begun, and the Harrington Army Airfield played a significant part in that battle. The Harrington Air Base was now at its climax. Base personnel worked around the clock on these new super fortresses, as they were called. A typical month would process 74 aircraft and 140 crews. Harrington was the first base in the second Air Force to receive a superior rating at an annual general inspection. 60% of all B-29s that went to war were processed out here. Clearly, the Harrington Air Base had become one of the most vital bases in America. The airfield was under the strict command of a hard-boiled, tobacco-chewing, no-nonsense Colonel Dittman. Many described Dittman as a John Wayne-type character, a man who worked hard and played hard, a man who was feared yet admired. He made Colonel by the youthful age of 29, 
certainly a rare accomplishment. Lieutenant Colonel Dittman was about 26 years old when he came here in uh, January of 1944. He was considered one of the youngest base commanders. He was a man who was very strict. He wanted his crew in order. But I later found out that he was also a very kind man. He was a sportsman. He loved to hunt and he loved to fish. And uh, he was a colonel, an officer, that not only mingled with the officers, but he also mingled, when he wasn't in the public eye, he mingled with the airmen. When he'd come down for inspection, he walked very straight, and he always carried a little brown crop under his arm. It was about this long, with a little handle on the end. And behind him was his aide-de-camp. And as he would walk past my chair, I would tremble just a little, and then his aide-de-camp would poke me in the back, trying to get a rise out of me, but I didn't. I was still very stern. The town of Harrington was a quiet hamlet on the central Kansas plains. Located on the main line of the Rock Island Railway, Harrington hosted a large switching yard, which was the town's biggest employer. Harringtonites, like all Americans, had suffered through the dark days of the Great Depression. Many businesses folded, many people left in search of work. But with the advent of war, Harrington was to be depressed no longer. Describe to me Harrington during the Depression. Was it like other, other Depression towns? Was it suffering? Harrington was suffering, but Harrington was a railroad terminal and uh, business had been good in the 20s. It was a very thriving city. And uh, when the Depression hit, it was just, I was only several years old. And uh, I remember quite a bit of it, especially in the late 30s. There, everyone was hit hard. Mm -hmm. The business people, the railroad people, the agricultural people, everything came to a standstill. If the railroader was cut off and couldn't work, then he could not go to town and purchase from the business people. So when the war came along, this, we all dreaded the war. We uh, didn't like that we had to face a war and send our men away, but guiltily, they did feel that they were getting a good income. The town was building up and uh, so Harrington boomed as a result Harrington, of the war. Harrington was in a boom period. Mm -hmm. Now attention please, all passenger car owners. The Office of Defense Transportation has asked us to give you this message. This is National Tire Registration Week. To keep our American transportation system safe and working, the government is asking you and me to register all tires of passenger cars during the coming week. This means you register all tires of your passenger car, including the spare and any others you may have, without delay. For to get a new gasoline rationing book, or to keep the one you already have, you must register your tires first. You can get an official registration blank at your local rationing board, your garage, auto club, or at any filling station. Then Along with the rest of America, Harringtonites waved goodbye to their sons, learned to live with less, and dirtied their fingers in the victory garden. My husband and I didn't drink coffee, and a lot of people like coffee, so I'd trade my coffee coupons for their sugar coupons. And people had, would do that, travel that. But we had a tendency when we'd go through the store, the checkout line to be checked out, to pay them these coupons, these little tiny stamps, and walk out the door. We'd think we'd pay them. You'd say, you haven't paid for these yet. <laughs> <laughs> and, but I was going to say, uh, my husband got to thinking, if coffee was so important, guess he better start drinking it. And so he, that's when he started drinking coffee. coffee. <laughs> but sugar and coffee and tires were the things that was the, was the, the most the things that we suffered for. 
But with the construction of a huge airfield outside of town, Harringtonites had a tremendous job ahead of them. Nearly overnight, the population of Harrington doubled. Describe the effect that the war had on Harrington. Well, it became a very busy place. All the houses were filled and apartments were filled and uh, the business was booming. Uh, it had, we had new stores that opened up, new industries that, that opened up, but the main thing was that we had a lot of soldiers and we had a lot of officers. And next door to us was a, a officer, a doctor, and his wife and uh, four children. And uh, they were from uh, Rochester, New York, and we had a language barrier. <laughs> she'd call a, 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 a bucket a pail, she'd call it a poke of groceries, and uh, somebody didn't uh, uh, drive it to the store, they carried it to the store. And so that was some of our language barrier that we had. Consequently, local businesses soared. Merchants simply couldn't keep their shelves stocked. It was a prosperity few communities shared during these tough times. But Harringtonites didn't sit by and prosper from this lucrative surge. There was work to be done, and they knew what they had to do. They rolled up their sleeves and went to war. Not in Germany, not in Japan, but at their hometown air base. Everyone did their part. On the off seasons, farmers left their plows for the riveter. Local housewives left their kitchens for an office job. Even high schoolers found after school employment at the base. Virginia Bruner was 16 when she started working at the Harrington Air Base. The reason they hired a few of us girls, they needed typists. And in this area, a small area like this, and all the farm communities around us, and being so far away from a big city, they needed all the uh, typists they could get for their steno pool. And uh, a man came from civil service to the Harrington High School, and he gave us a test, a typing test. And uh, there was about a half a dozen of us girls in my class that went out to the base to work as typists. I believe just about every family had either a son or a brother or a husband working at the base. Was the pay good at the base? My pay was a CAF-1. At age 16? At age 16 and a half. And just coming out of the Depression, I thought $1,260 a year was a fortune. I'm sure I was did. very, very happy to have the money. Others did their necessary part by simply opening up their homes to outsiders. Every spare room was pressed into a home for airmen and their sweethearts. The hospitality didn't stop at accommodation. Many Harringtonites warmly adopted homesick airmen into their family. Dozens of lonely army boys found that they had a plate on some Harrington dinner table or a gift under some Harrington Christmas tree. I figured that only, I only had a five-room house, two-bedroom house. How could I put any more people? We, there was, I had a little girl around a year old, and uh, the, my husband and I thought, you know, I can't open up my home. I don't have that much room. And again, they kept pleading for places to stay. So we fixed up an apartment downstairs. and had, It was paneled, and it was quite a nice apartment. And then we had a, a stove downstairs so that way they could cook their meals down there. We tried to, I tried to keep as much my home to my, as privacy as I could, but we only had one bathroom, and can you imagine what it was like in the morning? Mad with a, ba rush. a baby that was trying to be toilet trained, and, and everybody wanted to get in the bathroom. Uh, well, there was uh, two couples and us, so that made seven people that had to use this one bathroom, but we did have the, the own privacy of our own stove and, and our own refrigerator. We had, they had a refrigerator downstairs. So that's the way that we uh, accommodated people. Everybody took in as many people as they could in their home. They opened up every room that they had to them. I believe Harrington's gung-ho pride for her airmen is best embodied in this letter. It's a birthday letter to Hitler from local Harrington merchant Ed Childs of Childs Clothing Store. The letter goes as follows. Dear Adolf, a few years ago you started something that made us pretty darn mad in Harrington. In fact, all over the world, and now we're going to finish it. Your birthday Tuesday was not forgotten by us in Harrington. And although we couldn't deliver your present of high explosives in person, we can assure you that they will be raining from the skies over Germany in the near future. We're backing our Harrington boys 100%. And if you don't believe it, wait till the bomb rains come. Ed Childs. P.S. Buy war bonds today. Keep Hitler away.
But even in the 40s, you can't be expected to work with no play. So they played in this swimming pool. Hand dug by base personnel, it was the largest swimming pool in the state. All right, so it's been a few years and a tree has claimed ownership over the deep end. I'm sure it was refreshing on a scorching Kansas summer day. The Warring Forties just wouldn't be the Forties without the sound of the great big bands and a swing dance. Come Saturday night at the Harrington Army Airfield, Hitler and Tojo took back seat, while the tunes of Glenn Miller and Benny Goodman took the floor. Nestled above the bowling alley in downtown Harrington was the local dance spot known as the Eagles Ballroom. Rust has eroded the ornate tin ceiling, and the long pine dance floor has buckled and cracked. The piano no longer plays the works of Hoagy Carmichael, but now hosts a spider web. In 1991, the only dancing here is the occasional scurry of a mouse, and the only music is a gust of wind through the broken windows. But this drafty old dance hall was the place to be in Harrington on Saturday night during the 40s. Locals and airmen alike danced the night away. The years may have faded, but the memories of the Grand Eagles Ballroom are vivid in the mind of one of its former patrons, Ernestine Donahue. It was in speakeasy days. No, Harrington didn't have a speakeasy. They had bootleggers. And the, the boys would uh, get a, a bottle or a flask and they'd wear it in the inside of their coat and then they'd get a straw and they'd sip their straw like this. Sometimes the girl would slip the straw out through the straw too. But we also had a chaperone that sat up here in the balcony over there in the corner. When they dim the lights, anybody dim the lights, down those steps she would come and turn those lights on and she'd stand there a while. And about the time she'd get back up, somebody would go dim the lights again. <laughs> and she was a very stern looking woman. Her name was Mrs. Armatrout. And she's very stern and she was a very good chaperone. So that, you know, these were these were grown people, you know. And they still needed a chaperone. They still had to have a chaperone. Besides, Jenny, you had your mother with you. Yeah. <laughs> In the spring of 1945, a certain B-29 was allegedly flown to Harrington and serviced. This plane was to be the deciding factor of the war. It was the famous, and to many, the infamous Enola Gay. Four years and 55 million lives later, the Second World War ended. Within days of the Japanese surrender on the USS Missouri, the Harrington Air Base was shut down. In October of 1946, the Harrington Army Airfield was considered surplus war property. The city of Harrington salvaged and utilized many of the structures. Via truck, barracks were moved to the new fairgrounds no longer housing troops, but 4-H farm animals. The Air Base Infirmary found new life as Harrington's Municipal Hospital. Even the base chapel found a new congregation in nearby Latimer. The war was finished, but Harrington's Air Base certainly was not. Even large sections of the runway were salvaged. No longer refueling B-29s around to Japan, but cattle and route to fast food restaurants. Less than five years after the war, the airbase was once again abuzz with air traffic. In 1950, the Beach Aircraft Corporation acquired the runways and the structures for extensive commercial airplane manufacturing. Naoma Weatherman recalls working as a secretary for the aircraft manufacturer's Harrington Division. They came in 1950, and the last day was July 5th, 1960. Um, what was your position there? Well, I went to work in 1952 as secretary to the personnel manager, Mr. C.R. Jones. Then in 1955, I got promoted to secretary to Mr. C.N. Hicks, the manager. And that was a job that I held up until 
July 5th, 1960. How many people were employed at the air base? Well, um, roughly around 700 at its peak. And uh, not only from this immediate area here, but they'd come from as far away as Cottonwood Falls to go to work at 7 o'clock in the morning. And, uh, but the bulk of our employees came from this area and then were farmers. Mm -hmm. And of course they knew nothing about working on airplanes or sheet metal. But uh, Glenn Steely, who had had some experience training people during World War II, was put in charge of uh, training them to be sheet metal workers. And <laughs> when you would ask Glenn what he did, he'd laugh and say, I'm in charge of the idiot's bench. So everybody was fighting to get a job out there to be on the idiot's bench. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. We started laying off with 700 people, down to 500, 300 people, uh, down to 200, and then the last day down to three. Mr. Hicks flew back and he got out of the airplane, leaving it still revved up, and escorted me to the car. And of course we were both a little emotional because here you see your whole little world trembling down there. And uh, he said, well, who will take off first, you or me? And I said, well, I guess I will. And about the time I got in the middle of the road that comes down to Highway 56, he was flying over my head. And uh, I stopped at the stop sign at, to get onto Highway 56. And he dipped his wing and waved. And that was the end of Beach Aircraft. Other interest was shown in the base. In the mid 1950s, the Harrington Army Airfield became a serious contender for the United States Air Academy. The years passed. Beechcraft left the tranquil central Kansas countryside for sprawling Salina and Wichita. Two of the four gigantic hangars burned. Grass sprouted between the cracks on the runway. What few buildings remained looked as if a strong spring wind could knock them down in one gust. The future of Harrington's Air Base looked as grim as the war itself. But perhaps Harrington's Air Base hasn't been forgotten. In 1988, a California entrepreneur purchased the dilapidated North End hangar. His vision was to house and restore grand old warbirds. Shortly after it was purchased by the Military Restoration Corporation, Hundreds of thousands of dollars were poured into the renovation of this old hangar. Today, it is used to restore these grand old warbirds. Explain to me exactly what is the operation that the Military Aircraft Restoration Corporation is trying to establish here? It was their intentions when, when he first started this to uh, bring airplanes just like this one in that was maybe in need of minor repair for this particular one and then uh, it would be flown out to, to make the air show circuit. Uh, some of his other older airplanes that were actually basket cases, they would be here for maybe three, four years uh, being restored. Uh, many of them you'd have to make whole new wings, virtually whole new fuselages. It was a, a real extensive major uh, repair job. What is this airplane here? It, it, it's C-47. Uh, it's, it's another uh, cargo-type aircraft. It, too, was a, was a pickup of the Army Air Corps. Paratroopers used it a lot, but primarily it was for cargo. They would haul anything that they could possibly get in the doors. It uh, is a low and slow type of airplane. Uh, they use them in Burma an awful lot to fly the hump, hauling parts. Uh, it's as much at home landing in a cow pasture as it is out here on the, on the runway. The ones that we have here in the hangar, this one that we're setting in, is a Curtis C-46. C-46. It came after the C-47. Its, it's duties also was uh, a cargo type aircraft. They hauled, uh, many of them had, had a seat arrangement where they could bus troops back and forth wherever they wanted them to go. Uh, paratroopers. Uh, would use this an awful lot, but primarily it was another old cargo plane. And it kind of superseded the, the uh, C-47 in that they, they needed something with a little more spunk could haul a heavier cargo. So they come up with this old bird. And uh, it is a grand old airplane. 
It will haul anything that you could get in. It's got a very rugged landing gear, considerably faster maybe than, than the uh, DC-3 or C-47. But uh, it's kind of a maintenance nightmare. There's a lot of maintenance on this particular airplane. And it seems to be a little touchier to fly than, than the old C-47. Uh, people that liked the C-46 really liked them. Those that didn't like them did not like them. In the fall of 1988, the snapping of rivet guns and the sputter of engines returned to the old hangar. As employees of the Military Aircraft Restoration Corporation were busy reconstructing classic aircraft of the Second World War. But 1991 finds the hangar once again silent. Tough economic conditions have paralyzed the ambitious operation. Although the Military Aircraft Restoration Corporation still occupies the large hangar, production is at a standstill indefinitely. Fred, when people return after nearly 50 years, people who were stationed out here, what do they think when they see the base in this condition? What is, what is their reaction? Rick, I think uh, you can detect a bit of sadness uh, in, the, in the tone of their voice because uh, they are, they are coming back to a place that they haven't been to for 40 some odd years and they are, are a, a little bit sad I think because uh, it's well mother nature is taking it back and uh, they kind of kind of remembered it the way it was and they're, they're just disappointed that it isn't isn't that way still do a lot of people return to the old air base oh yes many of them during the summer months you know the tourist season uh, a lot of people that are stationed here come back to see us. A lot of them uh, rented uh, apartments here in town. We're here for quite a long time. Yeah, they, they, they come back here quite frequently. Always nice to visit with. The roar of the B-29 engine is gone, and the soft whisper of the Kansas prairie has once again reclaimed the Harrington Air Base. For some, the Second World War was fought in a bloody battle in the Pacific or in Europe. But for others, it was fought seven miles east of Harrington, Kansas. For Crumbling Kansas, one last look. I'm Richard Ulig.